Welcome to Resiliency Radio with me, Dr. Jill, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, and each episode, we dive deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice. We want to empower you with knowledge and inspiration, aiding you in your journey to optimal health. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Leonard Weinstock, on the topic of mast cell activation disorders and the gut specifically. It's becoming an epidemic, and I can't wait to dive into this topic. But first, let me introduce our guest, Dr. Weinstock. He is a board-certified gastroenterologist in internal medicine. He is an associate professor of clinical medicine and surgery at Washington University School of Medicine. He received his medical degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and completed his postgraduate training and was chief resident in internal medicine at Rochester General Hospital. His gastroenterology fellowship was performed at Washington University School of Medicine. He is an active lecturer and has published over 140 articles, abstracts, editorials, and book chapters. He's given lectures throughout the world, and he's currently researching our topic, mast cell activation syndrome, also small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, restless leg syndrome, mold toxicity, and rosacea. And Dr. Weinstein, you and I might be the only ones who know how all those things are connected, right? <laughs> yes, they are connected for yeah. sure. So welcome to the show. It is absolutely an honor and delight to have you here. Jill, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored. Oh, thank you. Um, well, we got we got to talking because you guys are producing a documentary in the future at the end. Stay tuned because this topic is so important that Di Dr. Weinstock and his team are really trying to raise funds to bring awareness. And we will be sure and give you all the information if you want to donate or support the cause. Um, I want to be the first to say I think this is so critical. But before we go there, let's talk about you. How did you get into medicine? What drew you to medicine? And then what drew you into gastroenterology? Tell us a little bit about your journey? Well, it, a lot of the people in my family just saw me as a caring person, an individual, um, not a businessman, and uh, always encouraged me to do be a professional. My dad was a dentist, uncle a uh, pediatrician. And so, you know, I had models. And, and so I always kind of knew I was going to do that. I was a little bit of a renegade. I did pre-veterinary medicine for a little bit in Vermont. Uh, but then uh, after I worked on some dairy farms and worked with um, a family where one of them had cancer, I just saw a different side. And I thought, you know, I could get into this. And I like the people to people more than the people to cow uh, yeah. contact. And so that's the way I went. And, um, you know, it did work out. And um, the specialty of GI was something that I saw during my residency, mystery cases and mystery symptoms and people going years and years with abdominal pain uh, where nobody ever figured out what was wrong. And I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. Maybe I could get into that and, and uh, learn more and get into the depth of it and then come up with answers. And then also you could look with endoscopes and colonoscopes and do a surgical side of things. So GI had a lot to offer. Wow. And what I see there is something I always see in some of the best physicians that I know, and that's the curiosity, right? Like the idea that you could actually solve problems. Um, I think whenever we go into medicine and think we stop learning when we graduate, <laughs> then we lose that curiosity. And clearly with what you're doing and even the openness to mass selectivation and how does this affect the gut, our topic today, um, it really does take a curious kind of person to keep searching and looking um, because as you well know, the complexity of the gut and the body and our environment are really exponentially increasing. Um, so let's dive into, first of all, just what is, many of my uh, patients and listeners have heard of mast cell activation syndrome, but for those who haven't, let's do an overview of what is this issue and why are we seeing more of it than we used to, you know, 20 years ago? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So the mast cell is one of our white blood cells. It lives mainly in the bone marrow, but when there's inflammation, a burn or injury, they come out of the bone marrow and go to the site and they orchestrate how much inflammation should be going on, how much new 
uh, blood vessels should be created to help heal. But if one of these guys has a mutation on the gene that controls them, then it allows for these chemicals to come out of the cells and create a lot of damage and symptoms, both near and far. And so um, the fact is, is it's incredibly common. Um, it's been estimated that 15 to 20% of the country has some degree of mast cell activation syndrome. Sometimes uh, people say, well, it's more of mast cell activation with symptoms and systemic syndromes. Um, but those in the know know that you have to keep your mind open. And it not only does it come alone, but it comes in with Ellos Danlos syndrome and POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, thus forming the evil triad. This has been of particular interest because at least in my clinical practice, it is just rising, especially since the pandemic. Let's talk about triggers though, because that may pull it. Oh, together, yes. Right. Cause there's often absolutely. Things, environment. So, so go ahead. Oh yeah. I mean, first of all, there are temporary triggers um, and then there are permanent triggers. So um, as often um, is the case, kids are sick with a variety of conditions uh, at birth or in childhood, and they have, you know, headaches, asthma, eczema, food allergies, GI problems. And then the, in teenage years, um, women, young women have severe periods. Uh, men can, young men can have uh, psychological problems, panic attacks, ADHD, and so forth. But they get worse along the years. And um, if they get infectious mononucleosis, that can set off a permanent change and more um, damage to the genes, making them more uncontrolled. Um, and then um, in, during adulthood, things also occur. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, COVID occurred. And COVID also put um, patients with a genetic aberration and activation of the mast cell on a regular basis. So, you know, whether we can get out of this um, virus that lives in our body or not, and therefore is affecting the mast cells, but that's what you're talking about in terms of what's happened in, okay. in, since 2020. Yeah, yeah it's- Or it um, weakened immune system and also more, it's almost like two ends of the spectrum, right? We have more autoimmune, more activation of mast cells, more immune like irrit. I always think of it as like poking the sleeping bear, right? There's these mm -hmm. cells that are supposed to protect us, but there's all these things in our environment that are kind of irritating our systems right. more than ever before. Do you see- uh, environmental toxicity, like obviously I deal a lot with mold. Do you see things yes. in the environment affecting this as well? Oh, yes. We're um, getting ready to submit a paper on mold. Um, this individual um, that is in the case report, he'd go to uh, different houses. He was a home inspector and um, worked for a company that dealt with selling uh, homes and knocking down bad homes and so forth. Every time he'd go into a moldy home, he'd have to run out of the house and he'd, uh, he'd vomit, he'd uh, have severe pain and having diarrhea. And just imagine that happening on a regular basis. But some of these uh, times it was so severe that he went to the hospital and his gut was paralyzed. Well, it turns out that he did in fact have mast cell activation syndrome from years and years back. Um, and then um, treating that and keeping him out of those homes led towards a significant improvement in his uh, status. Um, so, you know, that the mold is incredible. It, it can activate ma good mast cells as well. And you can get the chemicals that we see in mast cell activation syndrome, but it can certainly activate uh, mast cell activation syndrome, and patients can suffer until they get out of the environment and they do healthy things to their body that everybody who listens to your show knows about. Yeah. Oh, I love that you talk about that too, because what happens, I feel like is just the load of our bodies, whether it's infections or toxins or inflammation is getting worse. And I think that's why we're seeing more. I want to go back to something you said that I think was really important. And um, there's something that we were taught in medical school called mastocytosis. 
And this right. is a proliferative disorder, right? Do you want to just describe, because that was kind of the old thing that we were told to look for. And to me, the mast cell activation, even though it's actually more prevalent, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, than mastocytosis. But again, from the old school medical education, we weren't taught a lot about mast cell activation, but it's becoming a bigger issue. Do you want to differentiate that just a little bit? About oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, it's something that people could diagnose relatively easy if they thought about it but it was like 0 0.3 per 100,000 people per year get it so that's an extremely rare disease yeah. it seems like in med school they love the rare things you yes. know like uh, gigantism and growth <laughs> with growth hormone excess yeah. uh and mastocytosis <laughs> but really the fact is is that mast cell activation syndrome was not described in the literature until 2006. Oh, no wonder so, then, <laughs> after so, I graduated. <laughs> right, exactly, after I graduated. Yeah. And and they don't teach it now. And that's part of our problem. That's what we're trying to do with this uh, documentary and increasing awareness amongst physicians and people mm -hmm. in general so they could get help for decades worth of problems. And it is decades worth. But the thing about mastocytosis, it is a malignant disease. It can be indolent, very slow. Um, and then you get all the symptoms of mast cell activation, diarrhea, hives, itching, rash, abdominal pain, um, brain fog, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're very similar in terms of symptoms. But if you do a bone marrow, you'll see many mast cells because it's a, it starts there as a malignant disease, whereas with mast cell activation syndrome, you see some in the periphery, in the, let's say, gut or lungs or bladder, but you don't see any in the bone marrow. Um, it's very, very different. Um, and we're seeing much more of the MCAS than the oh, mast cell Okay, so <laughs> right. So if we're thinking mast cell activation disease, that's really three, three, three things. That's huh? MCAS, that's... Uh, you know, up to 17% of the population, that's systemic mastocytosis, which is like one out of a hundred, less than one out of a hundred thousand. And then mast cell leukemia, which is one out of 500,000. Okay. So that's the mast cell disease, activation disease, okay. which um, are very different, um, but also similar with respect to symptoms. Okay, so MCAD is the umbrella over MCAS, mastocytosis, and the mastocytosis leukemia. That right. makes perfect sense. And again, it's just for those, because we have, do have doctors who listen, so I want to make sure we're educating everyone because it's so important. So um, you work with the gut, but this is a disease that absolutely affects the gut, but it affects so many other systems. Um, do you know anything about like percentages or like how many, like, cause you can do a biopsy in the gut to actually show, let's talk just a little bit about diagnosis. What would you do to okay. actually diagnose mast cell activation uh, syndrome? Okay. It's absolutely doing the main seven um, chemical tests, four blood tests and three um, urine tests. Urine. Mm -hmm. um, the biopsies, the problem with the biopsies is that it's very common to find 20 or more per high power field. And there's some argument about that by the pathologists and others, especially the allergists. So when you're diagnosing mast cell activation syndrome, you have to have two or more systems involved with typical symptoms, whether they be um, hives or gut symptoms or itchy eyes, uh, ringing of the ears um, and other problems. Um, Two or more systems involved. Uh, fatigue is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, fatigue, brain fog, muscle aching, very common. I think I read the top symptom was the brain. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but one of the biggest ones is generalized fatigue and that brain fog, right? And oh, would... absolutely. And then you add the third most common symptom being muscle aching, and that's the same thing as fibromyalgia. So you yeah. got to say, how many fibro patients are really MCAS? Right. And uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients, how many of them are really MCAS and so forth? So, I mean, GI symptoms are very common. Now, as a gastroenterologist, I see them being very, very common. But Dr. Afrin saw patients with as a hematologist with just a wide array of symptoms, 
and 50% or more had GI symptoms being predominant and significant. So the gut is affected in part because the gut is one of the main interfaces where you've got the mast cells living underneath the lining of the gut and you eat some gluten or dairy for many patients and that activates the mast cells setting off the chemicals. So it's the chemicals that we measure um, and that includes prostaglandin, histamine, chromogranin, and we do measure tryptase because if it's high, you want to look for mesocytosis. But in the there are two camps. One camp feels like tryptase is very specific to mast cells, which is true, but in fact, it's not very commonly elevated in mast cell activation syndrome. And so the problem is when a person with multisystemic disease sees an allergist with hives and asthma and and they say, I think I have MCAS, they get a blood test and it's tryptase is normal. And the allergist says, no, you don't have it. And that's a real problem in terms of management. Mm -hmm. And, and um, the uh, allergist also thinks it's very common to have anaphylaxis, but our group doesn't think so. Yeah. Now, then, then there are th and then th there are three urine tests that are done: prostaglandin, histamine, and leukotriene four. And so, with those seven tests, my uh, about seventy percent of my patients who I think have MCAS are positive for one or more. Mm -hmm. And then the other group of let's say the thirty percent that have negative markers, if they respond to basic mast cell therapies like antihistamines, vitamins, flavonoids, and they get better, then they get have they're allowed to have the label of mast cell activation syndrome. Yeah. Hey everybody, I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. And we'll put that paper because I know the consensus statement that you have been an author on is one of the things that, at least for me, as a physician, has been a game changer because you list all the criteria in that paper and kind of say, let's shift from just tryptase as the only thing that we look at. Is it true that histamine and tryptase are going to kind of go up and down based on their um, acute exposures so that if you caught it during an acute flare, you might get it, but because it can go up and down, and then they're also very volatile in the uh, blood and urine. Is that correct? So, so correct. Yeah. So for, to address that, Ideally, when I do the blood tests um, and urine tests, I say, well, are you in, feeling poorly today? And many people are feeling poor, poorly. And so that actually is most of my um, statistics of the 70% positive okay. are because they're at baseline. And many people simply have fatigue, mm -hmm. flushing when they see me. Um, and so I'll do it. But if they're totally asymptomatic, which is rare, um, I'll tell, you know, do a trigger, take a trigger, you know, eat it yeah. or go out in the heat and come in and be off, but don't overdo it. So you're set back for a week yeah. um, and then come in for the test and yeah. the tests. Well, you have to have somebody who knows what they're doing because spinning the plasma heats the plasma up. Mm -hmm. So two of our blood tests have to be spun cold. And that can be done with little jackets that keep the blood cold in the centrifuge or going Which to the hospital. Which two are those in case we... So, yeah. So histamine and mm -hmm. prostaglandin are okay. the plasma. Got it. And then the urine has to be yes. collected cold and kept cold and then frozen when you bring it in so that it can be mailed to the research lab, that reference lab mm -hmm. um, that looks at those levels. 
So, and that's in your article. I know the consensus statement, some of the yes. details, but that's real important if you're a physician or even a patient listening. If these things aren't kept cold from the collection, especially the urine, it's very likely to um, make a false negative result, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing you mentioned early on was genetics. How many, what percentage of people have like... I'll just tell myself, for example, I grew up in a farm, severe, severe eczema, severe allergies, and then, um, you know, Crohn's disease and gut issues and all this. So I am sure I have all kinds of mast cell issues as far as genetically. Um, do you see that a majority of patients have genetics that are positive? Do you even test those? Okay. So um, the testing for the kind of kit genes that are positive require a lot of blood and research labs. So there is one gene that's commonly tested for patients who have mastocytosis and that's uh, available, but that's really never positive for MCAS. Okay. So Dr. Moldering's described many different mutations of the genes. And you ask why are we seeing it more? Well, is it because we're more aware and a little bit smarter or is is it the epigenetics and all the toxins in our environment that are changing our genes after we are born and then we trick our you know it trips the mast cell gene uh, controller the kit gene so that we lose control and you know then we have both weird we have a hyperimmune state but we also have a state where the mast cells don't know what they're doing in terms of controlling infections. And so people tend to heal poorly on their skin. They tend to go from uh, simple viral uh, bronchitis to bacterial bronchitis and same thing for the nose and sinus problems. So um, it's kind of a yin yang there. Yes. Yes. I've seen that. Cause again, this like autoimmune and this uh, innate immune activation, um, all the cytokines, which again, we saw in COVID, we see in mold, very similar, but then on the other hand, they're actually very susceptible to not being able to fight out intracellular bacteria or infections or things. So it's this very bizarre immune system dysfunction that, um, kind of the worst of both worlds. So let's talk about someone who does have this. Um, what would you do as far as starting uh, treatment and, and do they require with you as a gastroenterologist, it sounds like you're doing tests and doing a great history and then doing interventions, but they don't all necessarily require an endoscopy or biopsy. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I've been dissuaded from doing that. And also those people who are coming for their 45 year old uh, colonoscopy, they have um, mass activation syndrome. They want to be pre-treated with intravenous Benadryl, Pepsid, and in some cases Versed, and um, some severe cases, uh, Solumedrol. So you don't want to, you know, from the propofol, get mm -hmm. into a situation where you activate, get activated. And I've had some patients just uh, get into severe hives and it's been hard to get them out of that because they're very sensitive to chemicals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. There's, we wanted to talk about treatment, but before we do triggers, you mentioned heat. Uh -huh. What are some of the common, like top seven or 10 things that you see as triggers? And maybe there's- Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I just put a table together and presented an article because um, uh, I had a patient who for is 53 year old man, 30 years of attacks of abdominal pain, uh, diarrhea, uh, vomiting. And it turns out he was a paint salesman. And whenever he had exposed um, long exposures to paint, well, sales or conventions, all those uh, volatile uh, chemicals, organic chemicals uh, made him flare. So um, that's a table that's going to be in a, hopefully in an article that will be published soon. But basically, it's environmental. Um, it's um, environmental, infectious, chemical, uh, implants, mm -hmm. um, and temperatures. So a lot of the common ones are uh, heat and cold. Um, Dietary was another big one, and most common ones are gluten, dairy, uh, yeast, and uh, high triptate, high um, histamine foods. Um, if you go and you've got some implant, that can be a problem. Um, smells are a big thing. 
um, your patients of mine, they, they go into uh, Macy's and, and they encounter the, the uh, terrible odor from perfume and bang, they're on the ground, passed out. Some people, like my first patient ever, she said that the big um, box stores were her kryptonite. She, she had both POTS and MCAS, and she would faint going there. And part of it was the fluorescent bulbs. Wow. Amazing. It's almost like an unending list of things that could trigger. It, it's very interesting because back when I was diagnosed with Crohn's at 26, and of course, looking back, I absolutely had mast cell activation probably from birth, but the Crohn's, one of the biggest things that changed for me, and I didn't even know the commonality was a low histamine diet. I just knew these certain foods were triggers for me. So more than any other thing that I did as a dietary intervention, um, the low histamine foods. And again, I just was like, oh, this thing fermented this and, and these other things and like uh, aged meats and cheeses and bone broth and all those things. Right. Um, and I, avocado and spinach. And I had no idea back then. Now, of course, it's like, oh, it was histamine foods. And it made a huge difference um, in the activity of the Crohn's, which again, probably was connected to severity and with the mast cell being activated. So very interesting. Um, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about interventions first. Like what do you do as far okay. as natural and medications kind of go through the list? Cause there's a long list. Okay. Of things we can absolutely do. three week uh, diet yes. trial okay you know and it's hard and to go off gluten, is that the main thing yeah gluten dairy yeah. and yeast and mm -hmm. low histamine yep. is kind of what i say and no it's a little bit flippant to just say okay three weeks yeah. you know you got to do this but yeah. you got to do it uh, because you don't know how the medicines are going to work but um, there's basically step one treatment for me are um, all but one uh, are over the counter. So what I do is H1 blocker, H2 blocker. So this uh, in English, that's uh, famotidine. Um, we used to have Zantac, uh, but now we have Pepsid famotidine. And there's uh, two others that are harder to get a little bit. Um, but sometimes one person does better in one versus another. That's the same thing that could be said for the non-sedating antihistamines, uh, Claritin, Zyrtex, Izol, Allegra, et cetera, the trade names. So those two are like the cornerstone. But then the vitamins uh, C and D are important. So you want to get your vitamin D levels up to the ideal levels, 70 or so. Um, and um, Usually a thousand or sometimes 500 of vitamin C works better than the um, a higher dose. And then uh, a flavonoid. And if somebody really has terrible brain fog, then I'm going to go more with luteolin. If there's just more body uh, problems um, than body systemic problems, then quercetin. And then the only uh, prescription medication at this point, pretty much for all my step one patients, uh, is low dose naltrexone. Excellent, excellent. And, and you do that and, with ketotifen because that's a favorite. So ketotifen is definitely the next step after that. Okay. Chromalin. So part of the step one does include ketotifen, chromalin, and singular. But the problems are a cost. Yes. B, you have to um, do chromalin very, very slowly. Otherwise, it can react and mm -hmm. activate the mast cells. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Montelukast Singular, which um, I'm not quite sure, but probably 5 to 10%, uh, especially in mast cell women, get psychological disturbances. I would agree. I feel like that one's a wild, a wild card. Like it doesn't always work as well as it should, right? According to mechanism. Right, right. Well, especially if LTE4 is elevated. Okay. And um, and then on the ketotifen. So ketotifen's uh, very good, uh, especially if there's insomnia, uh, it can be helpful. Um, Excellent. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, there's some big players, right? Like immune modulators, steroids. If you really, because some of these, 
I in my book that I wrote last year, I have the four or the the preface is about about a young woman who passed away and she had mast cell activation disorder and she was so sick and I'm sure it was the triad right and I saw her way late in the game, but I wanted to kind of bring to the public the severity of these kinds of things and I'm sure you've seen that too. So when you have someone who's maybe bed bound, um, in in a moment we'll talk about the triad because that maybe fits in more with the triad and the dysautonomia, mm-hmm. but. These really severe cases, how do you stabilize them? What are the bigger guns, if needed, that could be used? Well, you, you mentioned steroids. We do want to keep them off. If I have somebody with severe diarrhea, though, um, budesonide is a nice one because it doesn't get absorbed from the gut. Uh, and then uh, steroids, if they have severe pain, they're in the hospital, then I'll give them my IV the IV protocol actually created by Andrew, um, Andy um, in California. Anyway, he um, came up with an idea of IV Benadryl, IV Pepsid, IV um, Vers- Versed or, um, or Ativan, uh, and IV um, Ketorolic, uh Tordal, which I'm not thrilled with because it can produce ulcers. And then a fluid challenge. And he gives those to his um, patients who have uh, POTS, but also Mm -hmm. MCAS. And uh, it can be very helpful. So I have actually some patients who are getting intravenous uh, fluids and the three things, uh, three meds intravenously to keep them out of the hospital. Or if they're in the hospital, I'll give that. Um, then, you know, uh, so it's the steroids, it can be given with that complex as well. But again, the more and more steroids, the more risk. Yes. Um, yes. I couldn't agree more. And I wait those at the very end, but it, for those really severe cases, it can be kind of life-saving. Now you mentioned Versed and, uh, lorazepam, Ativan, um, yeah. benzodiazepines can actually have an anti, even though we don't love those, they're very habit forming orally. Um, they do have a, a mass cell like a, a, an effect on the mast cell activation. Is that correct? They, they stabilize it. Um, there's an animal study that proves that, and there's empiric data just from managing patients that it's a yeah. very good drug. I mean, yeah, it's step two mm-hmm. on the step one, step two, step three would be uh, Zolaire. So if you've got hives, itching, uh, hives, sorry, hives, asthma that's refractory to therapy, uh, seeing an allergist to get um, those that drug, it's a shot once a month, anti-IgE, uh, can be very helpful. Excellent. Yeah, and I've seen in my experience, um, and I don't usually prescribe that, like you said, I usually refer out to an immunologist or allergist, but in the Zoller, I feel like it's just in my clinical, my small little experience, maybe 30% of people react to it too. Do you have people? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 For sure. So, so okay. it's immunogenic. Um, yeah. So that's the problem. But, you know, there's one good article about it that looked at multiple things, GI symptoms. And, you know, there was a 30, 40% improvement in GI symptoms. It even uh, improved uh, neuropsychiatric oh. uh, things. And that I wanted to talk about that if we have a moment. Yes. Let's do, let's go into that because it's huge. You're right. People don't. So let's just frame this because you wouldn't necessarily think mast cell in the brain, right? But obviously huge, huge impact on these things. So dive into that. Tell us how that could present with mast cell. Well, one of the questions I have always asked is from, you know, whence I knew about uh, some of the manifestations is, did you have panic attacks as a kid? And so many people did. And then Depression, uh, I started taking a history, really delving deep about depression, bipolar, uh, ADHD. And there. And Dr. Afrin did a whole article on um, different reports. And there were many neuropsychiatric disorders associated with mast cell activation. And so um, we just uh, published a paper looking, it was a case series of eight people who had a variety of psychological problems that were made worse by psychiatric meds. They didn't tolerate it or made worse or they were, and, or they were suicidal, some of them all their lives and just diagnosing MCAS and treating them for MCAS uh, 
got all their psychological problems better. So we're now going to do a more of a uh, epidemiological study to see how often it is and, you know, how people have responded once they're diagnosed with MCAS. So for me, this is like one of the most exciting things that we've done because so many people tell you they react terribly to SSRIs and other things. Yeah. And to know that there's something else out there. And that makes so much sense. I mean, years and years ago, when I was really studying just histamine, which is only one little thing out of the many hundreds of chemicals that mast cell produced, and there's a definite correlation with focus and lack of focus and, and even IQ. There's a couple of studies on IQ and histamine, which is crazy, but it, it definitely interacts with the brain on a profound level. Right. Um, you mentioned the triad. To me, this is one of the most fascinating things because to, as I've understood the triad, and this is what your documentary is going to talk about, it really pulls together some of the most complex cases that are mysterious as far as what, what's going on. Do you want to just frame what is that you mentioned it before, but let's talk again about what is it and how do all these things connect and our common presentation? Absolutely. Okay. So the evil triad is MCAS, Ehlers Danlo, and Ehlers Danlo syndrome, and POTS. And um, either they run together. Uh, just because they're common or more likely that there's etiology involved. And if you talk to any POTS expert um, who knows something about mast cell and knows a lot, they'll realize that about a third of the POTS patients um, are caused by mast cell activation because the mast cells live in the nerve bundles of the parasympathetic and sympathetic chain. And so if you're constantly firing away chemicals um, and also the blood vessels are there and you're firing away chemicals that open up the blood vessels and allow the body to pool uh, uh, pool vein, blood in their veins, their pulse is going to go up and their blood pressure may go down and at least they may have syncope or near syncope. So, so if we say, okay, a third of POTS patients are due to MCAS. Then we want to worry about hypermobile yeah. EDS. And it was Dr. Afrin's idea that um, the MCAS patients not only have inflammatory and allergic mediators, but they also have growth mediators. And that's clear from many of the um, patients can get subcutaneous nodules, fibromas, and also increased rates of cancer. So his idea was that the patients with mast cell were, who were secreting growth uh, mediators would make the tendons and ligaments grow, which would therefore make somebody hypermobile. Interesting. And so that's one way to connect it. Um, and so in studies that I've done, for, you know, I studied restless legs in um, 180 patients um, of MCAS, how many percent had it, 40%, but 20% um, had EDS, 20% had POTS. Um, so it gives you an idea, just looking at a patient's who had GI disorders came to see me, but I looked at whether they did or didn't have restless legs. Um, the concordance rates was 20% POTS and uh, EDS. So they're very common together. Wow. Now I have a question and you might be the author on the papers I'm referencing, but I've read some papers on rosacea and SIBO and yeah. also a restless leg and SIBO. And for me, it's been a big aha because so many of my patients, when we treat the SIBO, those things will actually right. improve. Again, you've probably been author on some of those papers. Yeah. But, um, where does SIBO fit in? Because in my, um, again, just very humble clinical opinion, I feel like some of the microorganisms in our gut can actually produce excess histamine and trigger mast cells. Is there a connection between bacterial overgrowth Growth or fungal overgrowth in the small bowel and manifestation of mast cell activation? Yes, um, there is. Uh, so I looked at uh, um, 130 patients uh, with MCAS, did breath tests on everybody, and um, and most of them had bloating, abdominal pain, or bowel habit changes. 30% uh, had positive hydrogen and 10% had positive methane. Uh, curves. And um, the um, 
the inflammation that we get on the gut lining is something that's important because that is one of the triggers and that's on the trigger table yeah. as is CFO that can make the mast cells indwelling in the gut lining worse. So okay. that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, restless leg syndrome, um, likewise, I think it's a systemic inflammatory problem. We've been studying it uh, for quite some time. Endorphins are low. Um, inflammation is high in many of the uh, secondary restless leg syndrome. And actually, uh, MCAS, I threw out that 40%, that's the highest um, positive concordance rate of uh, secondary restless leg syndrome of 40 different um, diseases. Wow. So it's very, very really, cool. it's really big. And so a lot of my patients that I treat with LDN for mass cell activation, their restless, their restless leg syndrome gets better. That's reducing the inflammation. And that just doesn't happen. Um, so there is the SIBO connection and, um, and maybe it's decreased parasympathetics. So you have decreased vagal yeah. uh, tone and you're, you're not flushing out the bacteria and that's why you get SIBO in MCAS. So maybe it's the migrating motor complex and that small bowel motility that's actually impaired as the thing that causes. I the think you're hundred percent right. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. would make so much sense because again, I see those infections often actually causing like the people who have the chronic um, viral load or a tick-borne infection often have some issues with the small bowel motility and the vagal nerve. And it, it seems like it's all connected. Um, this is so fascinating. I'm just so grateful that you're out there doing the research, publishing, um, and b whether you know it or not, I've been quoting your work for years. <laughs> because, Thank you. so you've been putting it out there and, and helping docs like me who to really understand what's going on. And I'm so grateful that you have been curious and uh, keep looking for those answers. Um, obviously, we want to talk about um, the movie, the documentary where people can you know donate or help support that efforts. But before we do, is there anything else on the horizon that you've been studying, looking at, maybe seeing some correlation? What's kind of the next steps in this area? Well, the next step is definitely the um, psychological issues in MCAS patients. You know, a number of us have uh, uh, large numbers of patients and uh, we'll hopefully send out a bulk blind email. If you do or don't have psych problems, uh, please just answer the uh, questionnaire and then we'll come up with an idea of frequency. Yes. of MCAS uh, in patients who have refractory uh, or difficult to manage uh, psychiatric problems. Some of the people on our website discussion group feel that most of their patients who have had bipolar disease have yes. mast cell, which yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. And again, my small little clinical experience, I would agree a hundred percent that this is so connected. And in, I've often postulated, I wonder if maybe 95% of our mental illness is actually organic, whether it's inflammation, immune dysfunction, mast cell activation, um, other infections, um, you name it. I think there's so many times where it's actually an underlying cause versus just something that you were born with. Right. And I'm sure you're seeing that too. So um, okay. where can people find your work, your research? Um, and then we'll talk about where they can donate to the film. Okay, well, under gidoctor.net um, resources, um, there's a thing, a number of uh, little um, slideshows, PowerPoints, and articles that I've written. Um, and then what we're doing with the documentary, uh, we're trying to make it a a learning experience for everybody, whether they be medical professionals, um, something to open the eyes on patients who have had to deal with symptoms for decades and are now finding answers. And then we explain what's going on in the movie um, to about mass cell activation syndrome. And then we are doing something unique. We're tying it to a library, an online library, with papers and PowerPoint uh, uh, presentations. And that way we help uh, patients and p potentially doctors who are interested. We have to get the doctors interested. We yes. have to get this into the medical schools. It's just absurd. 
that it's not. And um, as far as where to go, it's mcasfund.org. So it's mcasfund.org. No matter how little or much you choose to donate, that'd be great. It's a not-for-profit uh, movie, and um, so we're not making a dime, and we're putting a lot of efforts in. We've filmed half of it, but wow. now things have slowed down in fundraising, so anybody anywhere um, can, even a brick laying for $10 right. <laughs> would be fantastic. Well, I am one of your biggest fans, and I think this is so critical. And like you, I think that we need to educate our fellow physicians because it is an epidemic. And the more docs we have that can help us treat these patients, the better. So I am just, I love that you're doing this. I'm your biggest supporter. I'll try to help you get the word out and I'll be right there um, with the donations as well. Um, if you heard this, if you're driving your car, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast on the show notes, we'll have these links. So don't worry if you've missed it. You can find that on my website or anywhere you've listened to this podcast. Um, Dr. Weinstock, thank you for your heart, your curiosity, your work in the world, and your ongoing efforts. I know this isn't easy because you also have a full clinical practice, but we are so grateful. And thanks for taking your time today to talk to us. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you guys for joining me with this wonderful interview with Dr. Weinstock. I hope you will check out mcasfund.org and support this documentary. I think it's just a critical um, effort that we need to educate the public and other physicians on the prevalence of mast cell activation disorders. And I know many of you who suffer from that um, will appreciate it. Uh, but we hope you've enjoyed this show and I hope you'll stay tuned for more empowering episodes with new episodes I release every week. You can find them all on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to or watch podcasts. And you can find the complete transcripts and more information and links on my page, jillcarnahan.com um, or on YouTube. Uh, and if you want to have links to any of the products that were mentioned in this show or others, just go to drjillhealth.com. Thanks so much. And I'll see you next week.